Hello, and welcome to the September 2024 issue of IGIE. My name is Philip G, section editor for IGIE's section on historical considerations. Becoming a pioneer in medicine takes courage, dedication, and sometimes a bit of daring. In the early 2000s, a young junior faculty practicing in New York City decided to boldly push the frontiers of endoscopy into the realm of third space endoscopy or endoscopic surgery. He was far ahead of his time, successfully performing novel procedures that had just barely been invented across the world in Japan and introducing them into the United States, gaining fame and perhaps a bit of notoriety along the way. We're therefore excited to tell the story of Dr. Stavros Stavropoulos, who is our distinguished guest for the Historical Considerations section of IGIE. Dr. Stavropoulos grew up in Greece and came to the United States after high school, earning his bachelor's degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University, and subsequently his medical degree at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. After serving multiple years as junior faculty at Columbia, he relocated to Long Island, becoming Chief of Endoscopy and Director of the Program in Advanced Endoscopy at Winthrop University Hospital. It was at Winthrop that Dr. Stavropoulos became internationally renowned for his pioneering contributions to endoscopy and endoscopic surgery, becoming the first operator in the United States to perform per oral endoscopic myotomy, or POEM, as well as a pioneer in endoscopic submucosal dissection, or ESD, submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection, or STIR, endoscopic full thickness resection, or EFTR, and other variations of POEM, including G-POEM and Z-POEM. It was also during those years that Dr. Stavropoulos created the Long Island Live Endoscopy course, thereby establishing his institution as a mecca for training an entire generation of like-minded early adopters in third space endoscopy. Dr. Stavropoulos is currently leading the program of endoscopic surgery and third space endoscopy at the Mount Sinai South Nassau Hospital. He's a fellow of the ASGE, AGA, and NYSGE, a member of SAGES, and one of a small number of international endoscopists with honorary fellowship to the Japanese Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, JGES, one of the oldest and most revered endoscopy societies in the world. Dr. Stavropoulos, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. It is such an honor and privilege. Tell us a little bit about your own background and training in endoscopy. Sure, thank you for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, my background starts at uh, Columbia Presbyterian, where I did all my training from medical school to all the way to the advanced fellowship, and then I stayed as inter interventionalist after that for a while so so there uh, there is where it all happened i mean initially back in my teen years i really wanted to be a neurosurgeon um i you know i read i read a book uh a, a fictional book about a neurosurgeon that was really larger than life and and would do these amazing surgeries and he was a uh, very godlike so so yeah, I, I, it was a little bit attractive to me this this power and this skill. Uh, so, but but you know things changed when I went to medical school. Interestingly, I um, I had you know one of my anatomy partners at Columbia in our group of four was in fact a an heir to a neurosurgery dynasty because I think his wow. grandfather was a neurosurgeon, his father was a neurosurgeon. You know, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> this exposure made me reconsider the 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 um, the ca career in neurosurgery. May maybe wrongly so because you can't say you know a sample of one is maybe not adequate. But you know it was a pretty impressive sample of what I didn't want to be. So so you know that then, then I started thinking, and then I had an influence from my all my mentors in medical school. Like, you know there was this famous nephrologist who thought I was doing great in nephrology and I should be able to be make one of the greatest kidney doctors and contribute to the science. So so people convinced me that, you know, cerebral smart people go to medical subspecialties and, you know, those primitive people that work with their hands, you know, go to surgery. So, so, so that, that, that subtle... Um, 
put down on surgery and the the, the specialties that you know are manual you know started making me reconsider also Colombia had the fantastic neurology neuroscience um program mm -hmm. there so so i got very deep into that with all the studies of different nuclei of the brain i mean they they, they do it very intensely there neuroscience so yeah so I'm like, oh maybe i should be a neurologist or 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 something of that sort so and then you know when i started my clinical rotations obviously neurology was not very appealing at all uh it looks great when you design a problem of which nucleus has to be taken out to cause these symptoms but in real life most people <laughs> have gotten variety strokes uh that you can't do much about at least not back in you know to uh, the late 90s so so then i i now i got a cardiology looks cool and there's the cath lab and whatnot so i started sort of slightly skewing towards procedural stuff also i, I found out that i really liked putting A-lines and doing LPs and doing all kinds of fancy uh, swan ganses. I, I probably did the most swan ganses in a ICU rotation in the history of ICU rotation. I, I put all the swan ganses, the, the pulmonary fellow didn't care. So I would, I, would, I would be there by myself on call at night, it was quiet night, no admissions, I would just put some extra swan ganses. <laughs> And it was a golden era of swans too. Everybody wanted needed the swan back then. Mm -hmm. So so then I oh, this is cool, you know, maybe that's what I want to do. So and then on the other side is the, the misery of internal medicine, you know, medical decision making. So so I I, I gotta get out of this. Um so uh so I started looking what can I do from a second year resident as an escape. So you know that in order to use my internship year and not start from scratch, because right. I went to general surgery, I would start from scratch. So I could use it for dermatology and ophthalmology, which was you know pretty surgical. I looked into them, I did a rotation in the eye clinic for a month in my elective on second year. I'm like, oh, that's that's okay, that's good. So I applied to 20 programs in ophthalmology and I must at St. Luke's Roosevelt. So I'm like, okay, I'll be an ophthalmologist. But then I had another elective in GI with um, Pete Stevens, who, you know, we, in the mid nineties, he went to Indiana, which was the big place for ERCP. I mean, back then, I mean, the ERCP appeared in the eighties. So in early nineties, it was really where POEM was a few years after its inception. So you had to go, to places like the, the pioneers went to Europe or Japan, but then the second batch, which was Stevens, um, he went to Indiana, stayed there for six months, and then uh, came with, I guess, Glenn Lehman and Stu Sherman. So then they came back, and um, he came back to Colombia. He's really de facto the ICP guy in a gigantic hospital. So he's right. doing gazillions of the ICPs. And then I'm like, oh, this is surgery. You go in, do a and pull stones out, or put stents for cancer. I'm like, wow, you know. So maybe I don't want to go to ophthalmology. Uh, so then I rescinded my acceptance. That made those people very mad. They started threatening lawsuits and stuff, because ophthalmology is very competitive. You know, you leave them without a position, they're not happy. So then I, I veered off to GI. And then I had to get in because GI was getting competitive in around 1997, 8. So, so I did the uh, extensive research with Peter Green, who's celiac disease expert extraordinaire um, in the last two decades. But that's when he started his career of fame in uh, celiac disease and before that he was i remember he was give all these lectures on banding of rectal uh, hemorrhoids and stuff like that he was very interested in that but then that was the transition to celiac disease because he he's like wow you know the celiac disease is not just a pediatric disease i'm like celiac disease i'm like who cares back then <laughs> all anybody was concerned was a pediatric obscure disease that uh, didn't exist in adulthood supposedly so, so he's like, yeah, we should look into that, mate. Uh, he's, he's from Australia. So he's like, okay, uh, whatever, well, yeah, get me the GI fellowship. So he's like, yeah, do a questionnaire. Just look at all the literature and find out what we need to collect. And then, you know, we'll distribute it to whatever celiacs we can find in the U.S. 
So, so I did a look in the literature and made uh, in my usual way a, a twenty-page questionnaire with every, anything we could possibly want to collect. Right. And then the question, and then I had to distribute it. So I would actually go. I remember to the celiac disease support group. One of them, I remember one night it was at Sinai, like at eight o'clock at night. So I was sitting at the door, handing <laughs> out the questionnaires to these adult celiacs, and then I tried to send it to support groups, and they thought I was like a marketer or something, so I had trouble getting it there. Eventually, I got it with a lot of effort, and, you know, I, I was the victim of my success, because then they kept coming, coming, and coming. Like, every week, I would go to Peter's office, and his secretary would just hand me a bag of <laughs> letters with your service, and he wouldn't stop. I'm like, okay, maybe week, next week, it will start dwindling. It wouldn't stop. I had literally a year. I would go every week. Boom, another bag, another bag, and I would have to enter it. Which is, uh, in the end, I stopped at sixteen hundred and twelve patients, and there were one hundred and eleven columns, so different data all the way from when you breastfed to you know, do you have any allergies? Do you, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff that I collected from the literature. So, and Peter wouldn't let me stop either. So, you know, I kept putting it in and so we are like a thousand. I think we're good at a thousand. Like, no, no, I just keep putting it in. So I kept putting and putting. I, I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, so, and then at 16, 12, you know, I'm doing all these calculations again. Like I, every few hundred, I would do, I would calculate all, all, the, all the, the, I would analyze the data. I'm like, I'm Peter, like in every calculation, now even the first decimal doesn't change. I think we have achieved statistical perfection. <laughs> so so I was like, okay, fine. And you know, it was, it was also the interesting thing is that these people with their questionnaire, they would put all these nice letters in pink paper or blue paper, <laughs> little hearts. Dear Dr. Green, you know, my kid also has this, could you have silly like this? So I'm like, Peter, what do you want me to do with all these, all these letters they send you? That's fan mail. <laughs> Little love letters. Like, I said, like, yeah, you take care of it, mate. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he was like, so it wasn't just the, 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 the survey, because I became really good at putting the survey. I, I, I literally, yeah. do, while not thinking, while thinking about other things. That's how good I was. Like, I, like, I would look at the question and my, my brain would just translate it to an entry in the, the Excel sheet. While thinking about other things, it's, that's amazing, right? Oh my God, this is reportable. I have, so, you know, effectively compartmentalized my brain where I can do other things with half the brain while the other one just keeps putting in surveys. So, yes, yeah, so it was, a, but then the, those letters would break my heart because I'm like, ah, oh, you know, like I, I felt I had to answer. Uh, but, you know, I answered some of them, but when they gave me an email and whatnot, I did what I could, but you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of little love letters in there. So, so this was very that this turned out into a seminal publication, right. like uh, the adult characteristics of celiac disease in the U.S. Basically, the definitive study that said, you know, what celiac disease exists in adults in the U.S. and it's not uh, it's not rare, okay, and you know, uh, you should look for it. So, yeah, so that was good. I mean, it was quoted in the Steinberg course for years. Like, I, I took the Steinberg course at various iterations. It was still there as a definitive reference for celiac disease even 10 years later. So, and then we, and then we cut the database the other ways. I got a pediatric, um, uh, a pediatric one out of that. I, I got, like, you know, you could then look at subsets. That, that taught me, you know, that how useful these databases are. Once you get the effort to collect such a massive database that nobody has, right. you can then publish all these things. It's a, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great experience. So anyway, so I, I, I got into GI fellowship. Uh, that was, uh, basically 98 to 2001. Mm -hmm. And, um, obviously I gravitated to advanced adults that I've already had my experience with Stevens. I'm like, I just want to train with him. That was a bit of a scare. Because he signed to leave and go to Jefferson oh. right after I started my fellowship. Like, literally, I was the first year. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's why I picked Columbia, because of you. 
So, so uh, you know, anyway, in the end, he didn't go. Again, that was that resulted in other massive threats for lawsuits and whatnot. Because you know the the chief of Jefferson wasn't happy. So anyway, so yeah, so he you know he's like the Marina was the the chief was like you know he signed that you were coming. I looked like the moving trucks were coming to Steve Jobs' house. By the way, I don't know what Columbia offered him. He stayed. I was very happy. And um, so then you know I I I did you know the interesting thing is the I fellowship used to be two years. And it had been switched to three years, just a year or two before I started. So they hadn't had time to fill it with all kinds of things you may not want to do, like, I don't know, liver, IBD, whatever. So you, so they left it up to the fellow to do whatever they wanted at Columbia in your half your second year and all of your third year. You to could do what, what you wanted mostly. Yeah, okay. So obviously I picked advanced. And all the all my co-fellows were picking advanced. Interestingly, it was like really hot then. Uh, so so I had there were three fellows. Interestingly, one of them disappeared because something about he told him he had passed the internal emergency board. It turned out that he hadn't. And so so the, the so basically he uh, he was <laughs> expelled. Uh, so I was left. It was left, the two of us were left. Me and this other person, uh, Winston Law. So, so we had the whole year to ourselves. So, so what we did is, you know, first second year we did six months each of what's called biliary assist. Uh -huh. So you were assisting the third year, and he you would get hand downs, right? So there was this uh, little hostel next to Columbia called the Allen Pavilion. The third year was doing so many ICPs at the main campus, they had no interest to get in the shuttle and go do procedures at the Allen Pavilion, which was easily 100 DICPs a year, maybe 150. Wow. So there you go, man. Which I loved. So me and Stevens would hop on the shuttle, go do some ICPs at the Allen Pavilion. That, that alone was like, I don't know, who knows, 150. And then, and then the uh, the third year fellow also was on vacation, you know, taking the boards, whatever. So you know, you'd get at least another hundred hand down, hand me downs. Right. So, so I got two fifty by the end of my second year, which is insane. Uh, and then, you know, on the third year, we split it half and half. My fellow was with Lightdale for six months, and I was with Stevens, and then we flipped. And Lightdale would do advanced. That was a little more less, you know, tachycardia inducing. So it was like, you know, pancreatic cysts, sticking pancreatic cysts, mm -hmm. uh, EMR, and then no, baritology, EMR, ablation. We didn't PDT back then. So you had to inject and then do the laser and all that. So and uh, so it was, you know, baritology and pancreatic cysts and the US. And then with Stevens, it was anything you can imagine. I mean, he would get all these new technologies. I mean, I did this transporter device, the NDO applicator. You know, he would do all the ICPs plus all the prototypes, new devices and whatnot. And notes. You go he would go to the lab with Bessler, the chief of surgery, the chief of MIS surgery. I think he was to do to doing pigs cholecystectomies, you know, notes cholecystectomy, uh -huh. but sure. more on that later. So, so, so it was great. So the third year I did another, I don't know, 400, because he would do 800 ICPs a year he was doing, interestingly. So I would make another 400 myself as a, for my six months in the third year. And then I decided to stay on for the fourth year, which, you know, this was the first fourth year fellowship at Columbia. That, that's when the whole idea of doing an extra year started, like that was 2001. So I was one of the, I was the first fourth year in probably one of the first fourth year programs in the US. But in retrospect, I think that was overkill after 650 ICPs. But the good thing is I was basically an, a, a, an intervention attending because right. by, by after 650 ICPs, Stevens would leave me and go to meetings and go do his emails. This was the best year ever. Like he was, he was home at five. PM, because I would do all the cases and then go do the notes as an attending, and he, he just he was the co-attending. So he that year he he did the martial arts, he took guitar lessons, he was doing he did, he took lessons in square dancing with his wife. It was a great year, and, and, and I don't begrudge it to him, poor guy. You know, like, like ten years later, 
he got bad prostate cancer and that was it um so anyway so they had a good year in 2002 2001 2002 the advanced year and i you know i got another 850 rcps uh so you know so i finished my advanced fellowship with like 1500 rcps total uh, through my fellowship and because and, of Colombia, these are like more high-end ERCPs too. Yeah, that's uh, like at least maybe two hundred of them were, or one hundred and fifty were pediatric. Wow. Uh, I, I did. I by I think it was on those three years. I don't know if it was afterwards. I, I continued obviously doing a lot of pediatric ERCPs afterwards. But the, my youngest ERCP was a six-month-old. Whoa. It's, uh, yeah, that's crazy because that you know that Olympus scope that is tiny with a metal tip, you know the uh -huh. the one that um, is for really infants. So yes, I I, I was doing an apulectomy, precuts. No, it was like really tertiary quaternary stuff. Um, so yeah, so that was a, but it, I was I was in this golden era where ERCP in the US had exploded because it started in the eighties. So by the right. By 2001, boom, it was the explosion. Right. right and right. then there was, but there were still very few people that were good at it and doing it in a, in a exclusive high volume way. So, I mean, that's why when the, when in 2007, when Boston came out with a spyglass, the first spyglass, the only person that got it in all of the New York metropolitan area was Stevens, took obviously great consternation and <laughs> bad feelings for other advanced endoscopies. But he, he was not with the volume and the technique and right. the experience to, to handle. I mean, they, they gave it to, I think, 10 or 15 centers worldwide. Wow. And Stephen was the only one in the New York area, maybe all the way down to Pennsylvania, because like uh, Slivka got it in Pennsylvania. And Pleskow, I think Pleskow and Chutani got it up in BI. Very, like 10 to 15 centers worldwide. Wow. And Stevens was one of them because the volumes were insane. Right, what right, he was right. doing. So, um, so, yeah, and that was 2007. Mm -hmm. So, still, he was the, the only game in town for super advanced ICP at high volumes, like even five years after I finished my fellowship. Right, because by so, then you were already his junior partner. Yeah, so 2002, I finished right. like finished early, I think. I finished in March, not all the way to July. So I, was, I became his full partner. And I don't know, the chief then was a hepatologist. Uh, uh -huh. His name was Warman. So he, he said, Pete, you got to divide things equally with, you know. And now, being in Stevens' shoes now, that would have upset me greatly <laughs> if a chief did that to me. But as as they are, but have, being on the other person's shoes, I'm like, yes, okay. <laughs> so so he so literally so it was very very Solomonic. Okay, uh -huh. two and a half days. I had room two. I think it was like Monday, Tuesday, and half of Wednesday. Like was the morning, uh -huh. and then he had the Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, Friday. There was only one ERCP room. Basically, you know, you, that that was that was you know, if you didn't have the room, you couldn't do ERCPs. So anyway, so so, and then you know, the other the other two and a half was one day of office consults and one and a half days doing things similar to Lydell in Lydell's room, uh, you know, see. EUS, EMR, you know, mainly outpatient procedures because ERCP was mainly inpatient. Got it. So you cover also inpatient emergencies and all that, the two and a half days. And then the other two and a half days, you know. So it was very, very, very fair. So then the last, the next five years, I was also getting 400 DICPs. Uh, students would get a little paranoid for the rare things. Uh -huh. If you send one to let me on my schedule, you go, who, who sent you this one? Who said you did was one of my repairs? I keep me like we have more than we know what to do with. Why are you so paranoid? Like, why are you, <laughs> you have to always be paranoid. Now, let must me let him. Must, must be a New York City business thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, no, we both loved the, the yeah. crazy, difficult ones yeah. that was a lower volume of. So, right. so you know, epilectomies were, you know, relatively low volume. 
So whoever got one, I was like, oh, well, why didn't I get that? When, when did the consul, I, I, if he got it, I'm like, when did the consul come in? Yeah. I was paranoid <laughs> that they, they pushed it to his half of the week, you know? So, <laughs> so, so a bit of paranoia there. I'm still paranoid about these things. You know, now it's just limited to, you know, poems, really. Sure. Because against the rare ones, ESD, you know, if you do call on ESD, let me tell you, I know too many people that really are dying to do call on ESD, so and there's pl plenty out there. But poems, there's right. paranoia going on. <laughs> so yeah, so, so, so it, was, it was a great time because volume exploded, it was all concentrated on Steven, so like hundreds of cases of this crazy stuff. and. So, and I, I, I was left to my own devices for a whole year of fellowship. But the third year was unassigned, basically. Right. You want to do all year advanced? Go ahead. So it was great, great. So this, this confluence of factors was very um, beneficial uh, for me. Yeah, and that, that, you know, it's interesting because uh, years later, in 2010, yeah. uh, I started doing ESD, John Day from Airbnb, started coming to Winthrop in Mineola where I moved and we would do, we did like 20 labs on live uh, pigs be comparing different knives. So like, you know, Stavros, you got to read this book called Outliers, which says that, you know, if you do 10,000 hours of something early in your development, then you become like a very good at it, like an outlier good at it. So I'm like, yeah, yeah interesting. Because, you know, then I, I read I read half of it before I quit because it's a very repetitive thing. Like, uh, the, this guy goes and looks at, you know, sports, uh, uh, very famous sports um, people, uh, then like people, musicians like, you know, Mozart and then mm -hmm. Bill Gates. So they're looking and, pr and trying to prove that 10,000 hours. So I'm like, I'm thinking, well, well maybe it works because it's like from a brute two, force thing. Right, from 2000. <laughs> To 2007, look, 3,000. I had, I left Colombia in 2007 with 3,500 DRCPs. So it's just from that, like, right? If you multiply by two hours, uh, 7,000 hours right there. Right. Only the DRCPs. Forget, you know, all the other advanced things that we're doing with students. So, oh, uh, yeah, maybe it worked. Yeah. So it was, it was a great, and, and the whole thing, uh, the whole point of this book is like it's it's serendipity. It's not that these people have some kind of inherent genius. It's just they found themselves in a position where they they did ten thousand hours of this exclusively. Obviously, you have to like you have to love it. Right. But right, right. the most important thing is to have the conditions that would feed you this incessant volume of this particular thing, which here yeah, it worked because of this unique uh, confluence of circumstances. So I, I did a lot, and then we did a lot of innovative stuff. Because, you know, once you get so immersed, right, you can start. Then, then you start getting bored with the RCP. And after you know three thousand RCPs, quaternary, tertiary level, Columbia, Presbyterian level. Yeah, like, okay, okay. Uh, I'm really good at this now. But you know, what's next? So then, you know, that's why we did this with Stevens the first transluminal biliary access cases in 2001 like that's crazy and then 2004 i started dsd and then right. stevens was doing nodes colors hysterectomies in somewhere around there also 2005 2006 mm -hmm. okay with, with bessler in the lab and that's what then, then they did the first human um transvaginal colors hysterectomy in, uh with endoscopic equipment in 2007 and made it to the New York Times, uh, April of 2007. So, yeah, this is what, uh, so I think that was a long answer yeah, to that. Yeah, no, question. but I mean, but this is really a reflection of your, your formative years, actually, right? Between, uh, you know, between the, 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 the the last couple of years of your GI fellowship to your years as a junior attending and uh, Pete Stevens's partner at Columbia. It was really your formative years in uh, advanced endoscopy and in pioneering and innovation. Um, and I believe it's during those years that you first got exposed to what was happening outside the U.S., what was happening in Japan in third space endoscopy as well, right? I believe there's a story about an NYSGE course um, where Yahagi came and wowed the course. 
And I think that left a lasting impact on you as well. Tell us about, about this. Yeah, so there's always this serendipity involved. I guess sitting there, like it was 2003. So at that point, so I graduated fellowship in 2002 with 1,500 ERCPs, and I did probably another 500 like the next year. So I have done 2,000 ERCPs, including anything that was being done those days in terms of advanced techniques. So, so I'm like, okay, you begin to get a little jaded. Like, oh, okay, uh, I guess uh, the next 20 years I'll be doing a lot of ERCPs. Uh -huh. But then, then suddenly opportunity knocks on the door because so I went to the NYSG course um, in 2003. Uh, very nice course, week before Christmas in Times Square. Uh, on, on the, on the Marriott Marquis, it was literally, you know, you're surrounded by the billboards, uh, of Times mm -hmm, Square. Sure. And, and Christmas, Christmas, New York. Um, and you know, one year, one year, Chris Gustaut opened the course, was the initial, you know, welcome address, <laughs> dressed as a, as a, as a, as a Santa Claus elf. Okay. <laughs> with, with, with a little hat and the shoes. So it was like very Christmas thing, very, very, everybody's happy, it's the holidays, and, you know, they, and, they get, and they get, they get, every year they get 600, 700 people, which is wow. a mix of um, GIs, nurses, techs, um, maybe some surgeons. So, so it was very festive course, uh, and, and they, they mix live cases with lectures over four or five days. Um, uh, so it's like, you know, good, good course. So, so they, uh, they had this live case and that, that was, that was it. maybe not as much in later years, but you know, those early years, they, they, they had the budget to invite, uh, you know, before the airlines made it impossible to invite people from all over the world and have them do very innovative cases. So anyway, so, so I remember Yahagi and this gastric ESD, which is gigantic. Like back, I don't know, eight, nine, ten centimeters in 2003, and that was like uh, I don't know, three years after it was described in the first publications in Japan. So it wasn't that Yahagi had an experience in the hundreds either. Right. But he's doing it live, and he's doing it. There's no knives even in Japan then, so he's doing it with the with using as a knife the the tip, the tip of a snare. Like he protrudes the tip a little bit. You know, like uh -huh. how people use it to coagulate vessels after right. Yamar. He's using the tip of the snare to do this, you know, I don't know, uh, 70 square centimeter ESD. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> and obviously 80, 90% of the audience is like thinking, what is this? <laughs> you know, wait a minute. What, what is he? They're like, what is he trying to do? <laughs> is he trying to like do something so he can snare it? But because the, he, when is he gonna snare it? But because he keep dissecting, dissecting. So he started in the morning, went through lunch until the afternoon. Obviously now he, Yahagi probably can do that now in like an hour and a half. Sure. But it was an early learning curve. So these people were shocked. It's like, wait, wait a minute, wait, you know, this could have been done as a laparoscopic gastrectomy in like two hours, right? Right. But of course, the, the question here is, yeah, is that good for the patient, though? Right, you know, right, yes, right. you know, you can do it in two hours, but the time it takes shouldn't be the only consideration. You know, living with most of your stomach gone is, you know, for the rest of your life, obviously has a big quality of life effect. So, but, so, so, but the f few of us are looking at them like, oh, oh my God, this, this is like interesting. Right. So maybe, maybe we don't have to do hundreds of ERCPs every year for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. But this is like super duper advanced endoscopy, like it's big, like being a surgeon. Like, you right. know, it's like, okay, you can be a surgeon, you can do microsurgery and dissect this out in one piece. So very exciting. So that was what really got me interested that was the first contact i had with you know third space uh mm -hmm. this 2003 nysd live course by yahagi so then you started so, doing some of those esd cases at columbia too even before you went to winthrop yeah so in 2004 um, I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I can try to do it. And then there was this <laughs> animal lab. Like the very first thing right. was an animal lab where 
I, um, it was it was really Pete Stevens's and and Charlie Lydo's animal lab. They were doing uh -huh. trying to do something for Barrett's esophagus. I don't remember what it was, but I got me a contraband knife from Japan. Well, it must have just been invented, like a, a insulated tip knife. Uh -huh. So I'm like, can I, can I play too when you guys are done with the pig? I'm like, yeah, it's okay. So, so at the end of the pig, uh, at the end of the pig, like, I, I did the gastric ESD. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, it took two hours to um, do a two by two centimeter thing. Sure. Um, so, you know, so so then I'm like, okay, okay, that's doable. So then I started doing it, you know, in humans. But, of course, there were no ESD knives in humans. You uh, to make your United own. States. Well, no, not at Colombia. Colombia, I was trying to use the ESCP oh, um, uh -huh. needle knife. Needle knife. Which are um, not the right thing to use. A lot of bleeding. I remember doing one... I remember doing an ESD with a with a ESCP knife, and Stevens kept going in and out of the room. Like, are you gonna get done with it? Like, why don't you snare it? You're like tying up the room with this, and he's like, what's what's the point? You know, ESD is there's no they, we don't have gastric lesions in the U.S. and and Olympus is clear that they're not gonna bring the insulated tip knife or the flex knife, whatever first knives they were start starting to come out with. I don't think I'd ever make them available in the U.S. because I was afraid about litigation. So, well, you know, he was wrong on that, it turns out. Um, but um, anyway, so, so I persisted. Then when I went to Winthrop, interestingly, we did make a knife. With, I had this enterprising fellow. So, so he's like, why don't you put, why don't you make an insula your own insulated tip by putting a, a thing at the end? So then it turned out that he had this dentist friend who could, who could use his lab, his dental lab, to, to put this photopolymerizable resin at the end, which uh -huh. hardens to, you know, porcelain level consistency or enamel level consistency after you put UV light on it. So he would make a little ball of it uh, when it's soft, like, like uh, putty. Mm -hmm. And then put it at the end of the knife, and then polymerize it. So this, so the, the, so then, and obviously it was something that can be used in the human body and whatnot. So it was fantastic, but it didn't work well because the knife was still too thin. The the the, the, the ERCP knives, yeah, they were so thin that they they wouldn't coagulate. Even if you used forced coagulation, they wouldn't coagulate anything. It was mm. too thin. Any any current would work as a cutting current. And number two, if you try to use spray or something, the metal would would evaporate, would oh. disintegrate right there. Mm -hmm. If you use spray, it was four thousand volts through this little wire. It just, right, just it, snap. It would it would um, it would literally blacken up and crumble. So so, what really revolutionized the knife situation was when I found in the Olympus catalog two pre-cut knives for ESCP that were thick. Uh -huh. They were called the uh, the round knife and the flat knife. Um, the flat knife in particular was like a little spatula, uh -huh. very thin spatula. So, so this is great because you, you could you could you you. You had the proper amount of current density to uh -huh. to coagulate when you wanted and to cut when you wanted. And the first poem, actually, because the knives did not become available in the U.S. until 2011. So the first poem, which I did in 2009, was with a flat knife from Olympus, which is, I think, about five millimeters long and uh -huh. Uh -huh. flat metal, thick, uh -huh. thick flat metal. And the, the amazing thing is the cheapest knife I've ever used for poem on ESD. And I used it for two, three years, like those those least ex less expensive ESDs. I'm thinking about going back to it, actually. <laughs> it's still in the Olympus catalog because it works great. Right. And and, and my favorite knife is like the hybrid eye type. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't like the discs at the end and stuff. Uh -huh. So I don't mind. So, you know, I thought about going back because you could, um, it was reusable. Oh, interesting. And you could use it, I found out, at least 10, 15, 20 times until it blackened to the point where the conductivity wasn't good. 
Uh-huh. And the, the handle was autoclavable. Uh-huh. So you put it together. The knife would go and get, you know, sterilized, and then the, you'd autoclave the handle, and then you would screw in the handle, and there's your knife. So it's like super, like it would maybe cost, I don't know, $30 per ESD or something, or a poem, the, the cost. So this was the knife I did the first poem with, the, wow. the flat knife. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it, it worked great. I mean, I wouldn't mind doing an ESD right now with a flat knife. Right. Sometimes simple is best. I think that's, uh, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to overthink things. Um, speaking of overthinking things, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned that you really, it's actually quite remarkable. You have this amazing safety track record, um, you know, which I believe you said that uh, you uh, inherited that a little bit from Pete Stevens uh, to really kind of meticulously consider all the possibilities or all the possible outcomes uh, and really plan your procedures down to the T. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, that sort of mentality and that way of thought. Yes, this is very important because, you know, when I, you know, broke into the scene of advanced endoscopy in 2012, yeah. and I started showing people poem, and then, but 2012 was my first EFTR, which is even more shocking than a poem. Right. I remember I presented that ACG one year, the CFTR for a gist in the cardiac, with big perforation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people were like gasping because <laughs> they felt that they couldn't tell, was this an accident or, <laughs> or did right. I really go there and make a hole to remove the tumor? And when they realized, no, it wasn't an accident, like, <laughs> wait. So I remember... At ACG, they were, mind you, at, interestingly, at DW, every time I presented these things, I would win the best of the best, you know, video award. Right, I, I remember at that, ACG, yeah. I got like, I don't know, they, they had this, like, they, they scored you like the Olympics or something. So, you know, I, I think, I don't know if the best thing was 10. But I remember, I, I, got, <laughs> I got, I remember that the lowest score was Pochepin. He gave me a five. Uh-huh. Oh, five. We are both New Yorkers. What? So anyway, so so yeah, there was a bit of a mixed feelings, I guess, about this, because you know they see that and they're like, oh, you know, this is some young crazy guy, you know, right. that is out on a limb doing cowboy stuff. Uh, but that that is not really even close. Right. Okay? Right. People don't realize. Uh, everything goes progressively, right? So right. and when I started doing. Um, when I started doing uh, the the like the first aggressive things I did that were out there a bit of a, on a limb was the tr- transluminal biliary access stuff. Right. So I did my own first rendezvous in 2005, which then you know Chris DeMeo was the fellow, my fellow then was presented it at NYSG and. The, there was shock on that. I remember Hans Gerdes, big U.S. guy, one of the pioneers at Memorial. He said, "Well, how, how do you know you won't hit a vessel?" I'm like, well, "That's what the U.S. is for." <laughs> so anyway, so it's, it was you know 2005 rendezvous, and then there was in 2007 I did the transluminal stand into the liver mm-hmm. for some elderly woman that they had transected her bile duct with a stapler when they were trying to do a cholecystectomy. So, but but. Interestingly, me and Stevens did the first access cases in 2001. Uh-huh. And one went great and one didn't go so great. And that kind of traumatized Stevens. But we, we put double pigtail stents into the bile duct because of a mass in the pancreas that was obliterating the duodenum and any access to the papilla. So we just went straight from the, the way we used to do pseudosis back then. So, we, right. you know, put a wire, put a needle, dilated, put uh, a pigtail stent from the bile duct into the duodenal bulb, double pigtail stent. Right. So, you know, this this work, you know, and then, but it took four, it took four more years before I, I got the fortitude to do my own rendezvous. Mm-hmm. And then it took another two years until I did the transluminal access thing. Right. And then in 2007, we're talking about 3,500 tertiary level ERCPs and another equal number of EUSs. So it's like, you know, it's at that point, your skills are at a level where, you know, it's 
right you right, can think, right. you can you can incrementally progress on the risk of it but same thing with dsd and poem uh like i did I did DSD for five years, from 2004 to 2009. Okay, not in huge numbers, but still, you, you use this now, you use that now, you learn about bleeding, about coagulation, about the planes. Five years, and then in 2000, end of 2009, October of 2009, I did the first poem. Again, because at that point I was ready. I'm like, I had done enough ESD to right. know, wait, that's technically, that's easier than ESD. I mean, the risk is higher because it's the chest and whatnot, but, but technically, yeah. It's easier than ESD. And then, you know, I didn't do an EFTR or a STAIR until 2012. So that's like three years of poem, which again, would have been at that point, would have been at least another 100 DSDs and 50 poems from 20, 2009 to 2012. Okay, right, so, right, so people right. don't realize it has to be, got to walk before you run. Right. I do some course, hands-on courses, and you get these young fellows that then start talking, that came come to take an ESD course, and you can see that at a very beginner level. Yeah. They're telling you, you know, I have this gist, how do you think I should try it? I'm like, you shouldn't. Right. <laughs> EFTR is after you're an expert at ESD, because EFTR, you hit a big vessel outside the stomach, you, you, the patient could die, you know? Right, right. By exactly. the time you get into the OR to get control, you could have exsanguinated. If you hit a, one of the big branches of the left gastric or gastroepiploic or whatnot. So, you know, you have to, inc the incrementalism is important. But then the other thing that, that I learned from Stevens is the planning is, yes. like, it's like chess game. Like yeah, if I do this yeah. and this happens, what's my what's my escape strategy? What's my gambit to avoid that? Um, so you plan the you, you know where the exits are for everything you do. Like if, if I do this and it goes in the worst way it could possibly go, how can I escape without major morbidity? And if there's no such way you can see, then you just can't do it. Right. If you don't have an escape or something that's catastrophic. I don't care if it's one percent. If it's one percent chance of a possible death, uh, low? No, it's not low. Not in my book. Right. Because again, I'm very, very averse towards complications. They kill me mentally. Right. Absolutely. Uh, it's just they, they, they just stop me. They, they make me reconsider what I'm doing. So complications, you just don't want complications. So one percent of something catastrophic that you don't have a, a a solution planned for means this procedure is not ready for prime time yeah exactly and i think there's still many examples of that in our field right now um but anyways i think you know that you kind of this is a perfect transition point here but uh all of this experience that you accumulated really put you in a perfect position to start poem 